I'm going to start again. Uh, I've got to unmute myself. Welcome, everybody, uh, to this uh, Emerge Online session, Teaching Poetry. Uh, we uh, This is our last uh, StreamYard uh, event, uh, live stream, uh, before the live festival kicks off on Friday. Uh, my name is Shane Strange, and I'm the uh, Artistic Director here at Queensland Poetry. And uh, we at Queensland Poetry acknowledge the Yagara and Turbal peoples and their continuing connection to the land. Uh, we respectfully acknowledge that all our work takes place on the unceded lands of these peoples. We pay respects to elders past and present and recognise the integral role that uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples play in Queensland's artistic and uh, creative life. Um, tonight we're joined by four uh, very special uh, panellists who all have um, some connection with education and with poetry as well. Uh, to uh, chair the session is uh, Dr Kelly McGraw and I'll just introduce Kelly uh, and hand over uh, to her. Dr Kelly McGraw is a lecturer uh, in the Faculty of Creative Industries, Education and Social Justice at QUT. Uh, she's currently teaching <clears throat> the secondary English curriculum uh, and her prior experience includes teaching high school English uh, in uh, southwest Sydney, New South Wales. Kelly researches the fields of secondary school curriculum, teacher identity, digital, liter <coughs> digital literacy and children's literature presently focusing on the use of project-based learning in secondary English. Uh, Kelly is also uh, on our board at Queensland Poetry and is the treasurer of the English Teachers Association of Queensland. So um, over to you, Kelly, and uh, welcome. Hi, thanks so much for joining us, everyone. Um, so welcome, as Shane said, to our Teaching Poetry panel presentation tonight. And we've got um, four poets and uh, poets and educators joining us. And I'd like to um, start before I invite them, just acknowledging the Yagara people of the land that I'm joining you on from my dining room table here um, with my kid over there watching Netflix in her um, headphones. So well done for everyone else joining us under similar circumstances. Um, but I'd like to introduce our poets kind of one by one. I'll welcome them all to the screen. And I've got a series of questions to ask them tonight, but the first question just to let them introduce themselves is to ask um, what context they teach poetry in or what context their um, poetry is used in education in for some people. Um, so welcome to the screen, uh, Sam Wagon Watson, Angela Pieta, Ella Jeffrey, and Marjan Mosamaprat. Um, I'll just kind of go around the screen from where I am and ask you, Angela, first. I've got your bio here, and um, we talked beforehand about people's secret bios. So it says here, you're a spoken word performer, workshop facilitator, and producer. And people up here in Brisbane would know you really well from Ruckus. Um, you're one of the producers and originators of Ruckus. Secretly, lion tamer. Um, <laughs> people didn't know. Um, you might want to talk about that or tell us what context you teach poetry in. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I sit kind of pretty firmly in performance poetry and spoken word slam. Um, so I, that happens in a range of contexts, so to adults, children, teenagers, um, but I do spend a lot of my time in schools, um, particularly with teenagers, so in high schools. So definitely finger on the pulse um, and relating to teachers out there doing that work in high schools as well. Yeah. Um, Sam, we know, you know, you are a renowned Australian poet um, of um, Wanjabra and Germanic ancestry. Um, writing for University of Queensland Press, your secret bio is that you can turn water into wine. You can either tell us about that or you can tell us about your connections to school and education. I'd rather keep it on a, uh... yeah. A good level. <laughs> Look, I um, I'm incredibly jealous by people these days who I meet who who have a degree in teaching. Um, 
my mother and, fa- and late father were teachers and I'd often wake up in the middle of the night and have to go to the bathroom and I'd run into them doing prep. And there is so much energy that teachers put into the students, into their teaching, into their daily plans. So uh, writing, before I became ill, I was trying to study and become a teacher myself, but uh, that never happened. And uh, by my connection with, yeah, look, there, there, um, writing and publishing poetry, there, there are many roads to, to Rome as well. That is true. And um, I think one of the things when I think of um, your connection, Sam, I think um, especially for Queensland teachers now that we've got a text list that we use with Senior English to see your name as one of the living poets that's there as an option for study. And I know that's true for some of the other text lists as well. And so whether you like it or not, your poems are, you know, part of that educational endeavour already. Um, They've started to become canon, which is nice. Um, I was, myself, my classmates, never taught that writers were living. They were passed away, they were buried in England or something, you know. Yeah. We were studying entities that, had left more plain. Or if you were lucky, they might be old and grey with a long beard that they could stroke or, you know, grace you with their presence. Um, All right, going around our our little screen, Marjan, you are, um, you're an English teacher and you are working as an English teacher currently in Melbourne, um, but you're a poet as well. And I've got your volume, um, that site over here in the stack. so tell us about obvious, there's some obvious connections there, but when do you get to teach poetry? Um, I'm very lucky in that I get to teach it quite regularly. So um, as you said, I'm a full-time teacher. So a lot of the work that I do in the classroom opens up opportunities to bring in poetry, either to teach it as a unit, as a whole, or just randomly, you know, it might be raining, it might be autumn, it might be, you know, after lunch and I feel like it's time to take a poem into the classroom and just spend the first five or ten minutes just reading and, you know, enjoying. So there's a lot of that kind of work that, as I said, I'm, I think that I'm very lucky that I get to engage with. Um, I also run some writers' communities through the schools that I've worked at, so establishing opportunities for kids to come together who enjoy writing and part of that might be poetry and taking them out on excursions and doing workshops with them. Um, And, of course, you know, working closely with teachers as part of our teaching teams because a lot of our sort of deliberations, discussions, planning happen together. So there's that wonderful collaborative space where you can help one another to... Um, you know, explore poetry and and feel comfortable taking it into the classroom. Mm, Totally. Um, And nice. And I know um, sometimes I see poets scratching their heads and saying, like, where are we supposed to find the new fan base? Where do we extend our fan base? And I think of people like you, and I'm I'm a high school teacher as well, and um, I think there are thousands of us teaching English out there that love this. Are you kidding? And so it's about, I think, bringing these worlds together, which is why I'm so glad to do this panel. Um, Ella, you're teaching in a higher education context, though, as well, which I do a bit of, but over in education, um, you get to teach actual poetry, um, which is very cool. Tell us a bit about that. Oh, hang on, your secret bio. I forgot to tell you that, Marjan, you didn't get to make this up, but um, 
you know, you turn into a nightingale about once a year for a month at evening time. And Ella, I didn't know you were the youth fairy floss spinning champion in addition <laughs> to being a poet, editor and critic and author of um, poems, Dead Bolt. So tell us a bit more about your teaching poetry. That is true. In my in my earlier days, I was a big fan of fairy floss and have had an illustrious career in that area. Um, but at the moment, I work at QUT, um, Queensland University of Technology, and I am really lucky to get to teach creative writing in a lot of different forms. But my preferred form is, of course, poetry. And so I get to teach poetry at an undergraduate level. Um, as well as working with some postgraduate students who are working on extended works of poetry. Um, and in addition to that, I've done things like uh, workshops with high schools, uh, talks with high schools and things like that. So I've been able to work as a teacher in, in quite a few different contexts um, and get to talk about poetry to people at all ranges of um, I guess at all levels of knowledge, you know, people who really haven't picked up a poem or thought about poetry before, people who have come to uni to study something really different and don't really understand why they have to learn poetry or people who um, are maybe really interested in it but didn't know that it was something that they could do. They thought it was full of rules and full of complicated things and therefore wasn't something that they felt uh, comfortable even having a go at. So, I'm really lucky that I've got to teach in, in such a broad range and to get to teach uh, at university is really kind of a dream because that was where I got to start thinking for myself about my own poetry and start to clarify what I wanted to do as a poet and what I thought my poetry might particularly look like. Yeah, that's really cool. Well, thank you. Um, all right, well, everyone's had a chance to introduce themselves, so people who are watching along at home or watching this recording later on, now you know who you're dealing with. Um, and we really tried to get across the board in terms of different sectors and um, levels of experience. And so the first question I want to ask our panel, I'm going to try just throw it out and see who's the keenest beaver to jump straight in. Um, everyone here is either a poet who teaches poetry as well or a poet who has met several teachers um, having a go at teaching poetry. And I wonder, do you think that all poetry teachers should be poets as well? Um, and, you know, the flip side of that is can a non-poet be a poetry teacher? So it's a curly one to start with. There's easy ones for later. But who wants to jump in on that? Oh, I mean, I'm happy to jump in on that. Um, Please do. Because I, I really think that teaching is all about communication and temperament and passion. And I would say that you, you don't really need to be a poet to teach poetry. So, so my, my kind of contention would be that you don't necessarily need to write poetry yourself. However, you do need a fairly clear bound, grounding in, in poetry's highly specific set of vocabularies. So you would need to be somebody who's comfortable with using the language that we use to describe the technical elements of poetry, to be able to unpack and understand what's happening in a poem, to have a sense of uh, the lineages and traditions and schools and modes of poetry. So having an understanding of poetry's history, its different forms and styles, you don't need to be a poet to know that stuff. Um, you could be a literary scholar, you could be somebody who just has a real interest in poetry and have spent a long time with it. And I think sometimes assuming that you need to be a poet uh, sometimes leads to somebody who only wants to talk about their own work or is only able to talk about poetry in the context of their own work, which I think is perhaps less useful than having that kind of much much broader understanding of, of the field uh, to a greater extent, I guess. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Can I Angela, oh, yeah, sorry. you go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, yeah, I, I totally agree with Ella. I think that they are two separate skill sets and we've often had conversations in the staff room about, you know, you might have a colleague ask me a question about a poem because they think that I'm the poet. But in fact, what makes a good teacher is, as Ella was saying, you know, having a strong knowledge, um, having the language, being able to have a sharp and critical eye, I think, um, because sometimes, you know, the poet may practice their craft quite intuitively and 
not necessarily be able to get on the other side and see things with, um, you know, a, a detached eye. I think the the other really important thing for me in terms of teaching poetry um, is having, you know, I, I think the teacher needs to have an appreciation of the poetic impulse. So it's not just about being able to pull things apart and having that background knowledge, which is integral, it's, it's essential. But I think appreciating and helping students understand that the discovery process, the play involved is also really important because there's no set of answers and we're engaged in the work of meaning making and poetry springs from from a range of different um, inner sources I think so just appreciating that as a teacher I think becomes quite crucial yeah Angela seeing um, different teachers in lots of different schools I bet you see a spread of experience, you know, um, teachers who are new to poetry and giving the scene a go and seasoned types. Is it, you know, fun working with both? Yeah, I think so. I don't think that it really matters um, how much background teachers have in poetry. You know, people learn how to teach things. But I think having an interest is really important because that's what gets people outside of the box and thinks of creative ways to engage their students rather than just looking at the curriculum and teaching what they're supposed to teach. Um, it actually, if you love something or if you're interested in something, you'll find interesting ways to teach that thing. Mm, so true. Um, okay. Well, Sam, I'm just not wanting to leave that question yet. Have you come across teachers who are interested in your work? Do you find teachers to be passionate out there about poetry, whether they're poets themselves or not? In the last 10 years, 20 years, I really have. There are, I mean, any teacher driving to a living work they're singing along to a Nirvana song on the on the stereo. They're doing poetry, you know. Um, it exists everywhere. It's uh, it's it's so underrated how. Uh, how many writers are area mixed and employed? And, you know, and I'm, I'm just so amazed when I, when I ask kids, how many writers do you know they are none? So, what about the newspaper? What about copywriters on YouTube? Uh, Justin Bieber? May write some of his own lyrics, but it's a poet that's probably doing that. Mm. Uh, uh, it's funny, sometimes I come across teachers and um, where I teach English teachers at the university, new, you know, budding English teachers, um, they seem so anxious to confirm that song lyrics can count as poetry like um and and there is that kind of nervousness or embarrassment uh, i think in new teachers or teachers who are new to poetry um that they they don't know enough or they're a little bit uncertain of um their own knowledge but as angela said you know well if you're teaching it then you're a poetry teacher don't worry it's already happening look at you go um so for those teachers who have tuned in tonight because you saw teaching poetry and you thought yep i need some ideas for that We've started to think, you know, a bit philosophically, a bit biographically. I thought I might jump to one of our questions that was practical um, before we go back to the philosophical stuff. And that is simply to share one of your favourite poetry workshop exercises. Um, and if you are a teacher who teaches poetry and you're watching along and you want to put your idea for a workshop exercise in the comments as well, feel free to have a little chat and share amongst yourselves there too. Um, but whoever would like to um, go first, and then if I don't have takers, I'll go around. Spill, give us the goods. What's a good thing we can do? Period five, Friday. No, any time of the week is fine. Okay, I'll jump in there. 
Um, just a few very quick ideas. One of the things that I really like to do with perhaps the more junior levels is to act out um, some poetry and, and use that as the process of getting them to actually look at the poem a lot more closely. I often use Barn Owl um, by uh, Gwen Harwood and get the kids because there are six stanzas in little groups of three. They each have to put on a skit and then we actually um, interrogate and examine what it is of the poem that they've left out. So it helps us to do a really close reading and by the time we get to the final, um, you know, skits, we've, we've covered all the action at least, if you like. So that's one. Um, I like writing um, list poems as a class. So I might ask the kids very quickly, okay, the three questions, send me an answer, and then I will actually compile it. Or if we have time, you know, what would be ideal would be to get them to actually compile a poem using um, using those responses. So I did that just recently with question what is Australia, because we were studying black diggers in year 10. Um, and I got a whole range of responses and created this, this poem. And then the kids, you know, it was wonderful to see them look at how those different responses speak to one another or um, layer the responses. Um, so there too, I could go on, but I'm going to stop there. Good on you. I love them. I've done the list poem, but with prompts, and I stole that activity from Red Room Poetry back in the day. They used to start the epic poem with something like if you um, put the stars through a sieve and then people would finish it off. So I've been stealing that activity for a while now. <laughs> I, I often find that uh, when you're thrown into a classroom, you're not introduce properly the students so they don't want to know who you are you're an, you're an intrusion on their day so i usually uh, have tom waits what's he building in there what's he building in there what the hell is he building in there and I'll have 30 kids who just do not want to know me or something. Oh. So, well, what do you think he's building in there? Oh, man, the kids go nuts. They tell me, oh, boy, the poison's under, under the sink. Oh, he's obviously building a bomb or... He's signaling UFOs or, you know, they, uh, they really take it in. The, the sound effects of the, the track really engages with their little mind. Um, I've also used, like, healthy treats, like apricots and, like, carpet and apple. Hand it out and say, right, before you eat it, give me some ideas of how it looks, how it smells, right, taste it. Ah, oh, okay, let's come up with a poem about how we're going to use this. And, okay, let's, let's come up with advertising the executives. You sell me a banana. Yeah. Awesome. Make a jingle. So, yeah. yeah. They like a challenge, a challenge or a mystery or something like that, um, definitely. Um, Angela, you you have to do a lot of warm-ups or you train people as well now to do a lot of warm-ups. What's some yeah. gold still? You usually always start my sessions with something really high energy, moving out loud, like get the kids up in groups um, and usually with something that breaks the rules a little bit because it's good to start out from the beginning that this is not an English class, um, this is a creative exploration. Um, but there's a whole bunch of different kind of interactive 
uh, exercises. One of my favorites that I do quite frequently is a one minute life story. So I put kids into groups, they tell their life story to two other people in one minute, you time it, you count it down, it's really loud, high energy. Um, and then you kind of talk through it afterwards because it's that idea of everybody having a story and everybody having something that they can write about. Um, and if you start with your own kind of life experiences, then you've got a whole bunch of stuff to go from. Awesome. Good one. That's so true. I'm looking at the comments um, down here and I'm seeing some educators uh, adding some ideas, which is nice, you know, thinking about um, different songs and poems they can use, um, providing provocations, blackout poetry, um, the accessibility of haiku. Um, there's been one I've been trying to get working for the longest time, which I've called 52 haikus, and I give everyone in the class a playing card and they've got to write a haiku about the playing card. And in my dream, everybody does that. And then I make a display for the classroom. In reality, only ever half of the people hand theirs in and I never get a full deck. But <laughs> it doesn't matter. The workshop is a success, so that's fine. <laughs> um, okay, so we've had something practical. We've had something philosophical. Um, I'm... I wonder if you could share, um, people like to hear ideas for poems. So to indulge us by talking, poets actually don't always like talking about themselves, but I'm going to make you do it, which is to say if you got to pick one or two poems of your own um, or one or two events of your own that you run or, or something that you would say to teachers, give this a go, um, what one or two poems of your own would you share? Keeping in mind this is potential new fans out there who'd love to um, pick up your volume or come along to Ruckus or um, whatever it is you do. So what do you think they'd like the most? Hard. I feel like people with only one volume should go first because you've got less to choose from. Maybe, I don't know, what would be politically wise? Um, <laughs> I'm happy to go first, Kelly, if you'd like. Yeah, you go. And anyone yeah, else in the chat, tell me if they want to go next. Yep. <laughs> um, okay, so a couple of things come to mind, one of which is there's a, a technique that I really like to do in my poems um, that I've done quite a bit in, in Deadbolt, which is my first book, um, which is really just a variation on the list poem, um, and it involves just repeating a word or an object or an item over and over again, but in increasingly different ways and it sort of creates this accumulation of images and is paired with a kind of I guess a use of rhyme usually imperfect rhymes throughout so there's a kind of there's a musicality that comes from the rhyme but there's also a musicality that comes from the repetition of just the same word over and over again um, and so I think that that could be interesting I have I actually did a school visit yesterday where I looked at that with a group of high school students and we talked about how they might interpret each different variation. Uh, there's a poem that I have called In the Former French Concession, which is um, about seeing basically just a whole heap of fish in a whole heap of different contexts. Um, and the fish are, uh, are kind of likened to a range of different things. The speaker's kind of moving through a neighbourhood and thinking about them and kind of gets closer and closer and closer to home. Um, and so it's a poem where you can sort of track the way that metaphor works, the way that sound works, and the way that repetition works. And I think those are, are sort of some of the key, I guess, building blocks of technology. And you can really do it with with anything. Like I do it all, my, all the time as an exercise for myself is to just do that kind of thing with, with anything. You know, you can do it with any object. You could do it with a peg or a remote, or you could have a student just grab something out of their bag and do that same kind of repetition with whatever happened to be at hand or whatever they could see out the window. So I think maybe it's a kind of functional activity um, and a poem that kind of suits that. Nice one. Yeah. Poems as a lesson. Um, yeah. <laughs> Watch how I do this, isn't it really good? And you can get really excited. Someone said something before, like I think it was Belinda um, in the chat, you know, that when people love something and they're passionate about mm. it, it's infectious. Mm. And, you know, poets can be shy, but once you start talking to them about the technicalities of their poetry, it's like talking to a mechanic, yeah. you know, it's really yeah, cool. yeah. It was amazing because, you know, even these students who the teachers had told me didn't tend to want to offer thoughts, had some things to say that weren't really, I wasn't really 
guiding them beyond that. I was sort of just saying, how would you interpret these images? How would you interpret these sounds? And they, they really supplied all of that. It wasn't, it wasn't really a lot of me interpreting my own poem, which I think is, is important because they definitely don't need, they're not there. Like, like Sam was saying, they're not there to see me. They don't really care about that. They're interested in what's fun about it. They're so cruel. Um, Marjan, what would you share out of your work? What, what would you like people to take a look at? Um, I guess, you know, in a way, a little bit similar to Ella, one of the things that I've really been um, playing around with in, in this second volume, and I'm holding it up only because you really have to see it on the page to um, really get a sense of what I'm talking about. I've been working a lot with having two columns. I don't know which way I have to hold them. Um, and what the two columns I found has enabled me to do is to have almost like um, a secondary voice coming in and reflecting and being able to engage in a kind of dialogue and to complicate what you see in the left-hand column. So if I had to, I've never taught my own poetry, but um, I think it, it would be interesting to take a poem like that into the classroom and to talk about what is it that that second column adds how does it further? How does it question? Um, and I, I think for myself personally, I've drifted towards that in this collection because I've wanted to be able to interrogate and challenge and, um, you know, be able to shift, I guess, the perspective a little bit more in these poems because I always, I'm always asking myself, how do I layer? How do I add depth? How do I open and create a space for a, a broadening? Um, so I think that that's kind of where I've landed recently and I've been enjoying kind of writing in that style. I think it, it, it's interesting for kids perhaps to engage with that. Nice one. Um, uh, Sam, moving on to you, I was yeah. thinking about... Um, you know, having to pick one of your poems has extra weight because you do appear on those prescribed text lists. And mm. what a surreal feeling that must be, you know, like some other poets feel that as well, you know, Ellen Van Nieven, um, Ali Kobe Ekerman, Ali Elizade, you know, people who are on those lists have to think of their work out there in schools being studied. Um, yeah. I wonder which, you know, one or two poems you're hoping really rise to the top. Like when we we know when we're studying Les Murray, we're going to do Absolutely Ordinary Rainbow. You know, when we do Judith Wright, there's the same, you know, usual suspects that crop up all the time. So what do you hope will be your usual suspects? Uh, well, Ella said, uh, said about interpretation, it's amazing what you don't interpret in your poem, but the students do. They see something very different than what what you see. And um, the the alphabet of fish, which I crop these students. Um, of our baitness, the way fish move and the the, the structure and uh, the way their 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 bodies shape into the letters. Uh, I'm talking for my brother students. Uh, different concepts that I myself don't visualise. Uh, so once again, it's, it's every classroom experience, it, it, it's a learning curve for myself as, as a practitioner. Yeah, good point. And that will, that will resonate with everyone listening. Anyone, you know, any kind of um, educational context, um, that will resonate. Um, Angela, we've mostly been talking about poems that are on the page. 
you do the poems um, that are on the yeah, stage. I thought you'd be hard up finding many poems that exist in the real world on uh, on the page for me. Um, yeah, like I've got a couple of pieces that have been published as part of collections um, that I guess could be used in schools, but often teachers will show students clips of stuff they found of me on YouTube because it is about that performance context. So they get to see um, uh, a different style of poetry, I guess, than, than often what is being taught in schools. Yeah, right. And does it make you, this is a no-brainer, but how happy does it make you um, to know that there are more performance poets? You know, Luca Lesson was just added to the Queensland list this year. Kate Tempest has been on the literature list for a little while now. Um, it feels nice, doesn't it? That that's... It does. And I think it's really indicative of following the trends for young people. Like young people are really interested in that performance context. And I think that's how you move young people through two more complicated forms of poetry and unpacking poetry and looking at it in different ways is, um, you know, kind of getting them in wherever they're at, whether that's hip hop or uh, slam or, you know, TikTok videos, like whatever it is that they're interested in and then moving it through to something, uh, something else. Yeah, absolutely. All right, nice one. Well, there's the there's the little pluggy question. Um, I want to go back to something more philosophical, which is is the why. Um, so some people tuning in might be yet to be uh, poetry teachers or reluctant poetry teachers or um, anxious poetry teachers. Uh, why? What? Um, how did we put it here? Um, who benefits from teaching poetry, for starters? I mean, when you think about the job of a high school English teacher um, having to fit in a novel study and a media study and now a social media study and a film study and um, so much it gets packed into a year, it can be hard to find time to do poetry justice. And... I know in the higher education sector, sometimes those interests get squeezed out of degrees as well or minimised in degrees. In the publishing sector, poetry gets minimised sometimes or um, ignored in preference to prose literature. Uh, so with that being the context, like what's the argument for poetry? Who benefits and why should we be passionate about teaching it? I've got some ideas there, Kelly, just to mm -hmm. start um, the ball rolling. I guess for me it becomes a question of why teach art in schools because for me poetry is an art form and that's why it's important to help appreciate, you know, what limits can do, uh, what language can do, mm. where the limits of language are, how we can play it's a tool. I mean, you're gifting students a tool for self-expression that is a liberating force. Um, and I think also for them to be able to be attuned to that kind of beauty and art form where it exists in the real world, I think it really helps to kind of elevate our capacity to appreciate you know, beauty in the natural world where we might find it. And for me, I keep saying beauty, you know, I, I see poetry as something that can elevate. It certainly has lots of other functions, you know, it, it challenges, it can expose, it, it can do all sorts of um, very powerful things. But I think as an art form, it's really important that we create a space for it um, in the English classroom. Oh, such a nice comments just come up from, you know, Nikki talking about poetry being brought into the health curriculum um, as an element of well-being, like just to kind of mm. riff on that as well. Um, mm. That's a really, gosh, yeah, I would love that. So not just the arts but also that there is that health benefit as well. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I, work in, I work in broadcasting and uh, before I got sick and Sorry, I started losing my voice. I mean, to have a grasp on poetry really helped me fit a t into a two-minute radio announcement about health and well-being, getting it out there on the radio. So each little community announcement that I was paid to 
construct when a radio jingle is not much different from a poem. So, yeah. yeah. It's not a, it's not avoidable. When people say, when you ask that question, you know, what's the point of it or what good does it do? It's kind of missing the point. Is it's going to exist anyway? Um, you know, poetry runs through many places. Uh, I would also. Oh, is it okay to add something, Kelly? Yeah. What would you say, Ella? Oh, I would also just add that poetry is about to me is about precision and is about attention. You know, it teaches us, as Marjan was saying. It teaches us to pay attention to the world around us, whether what we recognise is beautiful or not. It teaches us to look very closely and to think very carefully. And I think that's really important. And the other thing it does is ask us to think really carefully about language. You know, we use language so frequently, written, verbal, et cetera, et cetera. And I think poetry asks us to think about that in a really close and attentive way that bleeds out into all kinds of other areas. So, you know, I teach lots of creative writing students who are interested in language but perhaps don't really understand how poetry is related to that. And I think, you know, that, that is a question that that I often encounter, you know, what's the point of me learning poetry if I want to write a novel? What's the point of me learning poetry if I want to do something else? And it's that poetry brings concision and a kind of capacity to distill ideas down and to write in a really precise and, and a really original way, I think. Um, so it's that kind of attention to both language and to the world around you that I think poetry can teach and that almost anybody can use in their everyday life in any way, but specifically people who are learning to use language in an effective way can use. Nice. Um, Angela? Nothing to add. <laughs> Nothing to add, yeah. <laughs> poetry is everywhere. Poetry is expression. Poetry is well-being. Poetry is precision. Um, and it's also true. Um, okay, good. Um, there's two questions I want to fit in. We've kind of got about 15 more minutes on the clock. So there's at least two I want to fit in. Um, one I'll do next, which is some of the most unproductive things you think that poetry teachers do um, so it is an unproductive thing and the other question I really want to fit in is for you to tell us about other poems not ones by you but ones by other poets that you have found to be quite useful in generating responses from students we've heard a few already tonight and I know just people love more and more of those ideas so that's what's coming up um, but first what are some no-nos what is um, an unproductive way that you've seen or that you could think of to approach the teaching of poetry. And I'll be quiet on this one because I have many views, but this is not about me. Um, I'll throw open to you. Well, I'm, I'm happy to say I've, I've never met an English teacher who doesn't have a good idea about uh, inspiring the students so nothing unproductive we're just we're just so good that's what i like you sam i like you more and more every time we meet okay. um yes english teachers have only good ideas i'll take that um i think what sam was saying earlier about everything being poetry is so true and i think often um sometimes teachers can get really stuck in this really kind of binary idea of what poetry is which doesn't engage students um, but if you encourage all the forms that it comes in you're going to have an opportunity to hook people in i've seen kids you know do amazing freestyle raps in classes i've been in and the teachers have gone that's not what we're here doing i'm like they're showing heaps of promise and talent and like a huge amount of skill to put that together um well, it's yeah. quite mathematical say that again sam it's quite mathematical totally it's and good. it's just finding what 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 are they interested in how do you link that to poetry and make that um within kind of what you're trying to teach rather than telling yeah. kids they're doing it wrong timing breath work it's all mathematics really mm -hmm. I think too, you know, finding a road into if you want to go to analysis, finding 
finding a road to get there rather than necessarily starting with that. Like we're going to do poetry now, we're going to read this poem and analyse and answer 10 questions. Like you need to start with engaging and I always start by getting the kids to read the poem first. Now I might do the first reading or I might throw it open to a screen and we'll just read three or four times. I'll read it, you know, at least once and I'll get them read it to a partner, listen to it, draw something that emerges for you. You don't need to understand it, taking that pressure away. Maybe just find an image that you like, something in the poem that speaks to you. I think it's really important to understand that poetry is not just a rational exercise, it's a super rational exercise, you know, so they can connect with things that they don't understand but that they can feel. Um, and, you know, what also Angela was saying about you need to really be open to the exercise of poetry as, you know, a, a process of meaning making and interpreting. There's not one answer but there's a coherent reading. Um, so I think just getting some of those general principles down and then ultimately get kids to write. You know, there's one thing to read, but there's one thing to respond. That was probably the one thing that I would, you know, come in and, come and say is unproductive is when it is all just analysis and response and there's no writing as well mm. and you know, we do analysis quite well sometimes as English teachers, but don't trust ourselves to lead students in writing or process. Um, mm. So, yeah, I think it's, it's so much more productive when they get to have a write themselves and, yeah, see the other side of it. Mm. Yeah, Ella, um, what's unproductive in um, the higher education space? Um, I think there are a few things. You know, I, I often, I sort of encounter students after they've been to high school, they haven't, you know, been at school for quite a while. They're coming to us as mature age students. So they come from, from all kinds of different backgrounds. And one of the things that I see all the time is this, this real sense that poetry, there's two ways they might think about it. One of which is poetry has a single specific meaning. And if I don't get what that is from reading this poem, then I've gotten it wrong. Like it's a kind of it's a, it's a kind of really narrow form of analysis that they feel they have to apply to the poem. Um, or poetry can be anything. There are no rules at all when poetry exists. You know, it can be whatever I feel it is. If that's my interpretation of the poem, then that's what it is. And I, th I think the sweet spot is actually somewhere in, in the middle of that, right? It can't just be absolutely whatever um, because there are things that the poet intends. There are things happening in the poem. And the thing that I think is the least productive is perhaps to focus too much on theme and not spend enough time just look like what's happening in the poem what does the title tell us how what does it look like on the page what is what is actually happening like is the poet in the poem is the speaker going for a walk is the speaker looking at a bird like what's happening in a really simple sense and that's where you can start to get that engagement you know there's something there to connect to that's this poem is then writing you know about something that's tethered perhaps to a world that we can recognise and understand and progress from there into a more detailed and perhaps complex engagement with, with theme and so on, if we need to. But I think that idea of analysis having to be really specific or poems just being, you know, free spaces for free association is also really not particularly useful because then a poem could basically be anything and it's not it, it is a form that has its own conventions it has specific techniques and rules and whether or not we agree about how we might want to use those or break those or change those they are still there and they are worth thinking about because they produce delight that's the pleasure of reading poetry is the way that a poet uses or works with or subverts or changes some of those those technical elements and students can find the pleasure in that and find the fun in that if you're there with them showing them through it absolutely yeah and what it does take I think just to circle back to what we said at the start was it doesn't necessarily matter if you're not a poet yourself and you're not a writer or a performer of poetry it matters that you're a poetry lover or, or mm -hmm. that you're a poetry enthusiast and you're going to bring that there um before I ask the last question which is um probably the last question, you know, what other poems you would recommend. I just want to give a plug to a few podcasts that I listen to around 
poetry, which have really helped me as a teacher of poetry. And if any of you know other ones, mention them or people online, chuck them into the chat as well. Um, around this time last year, someone put me onto um, the On Being podcast, the Poetry Unbound. Um, it's one from the States. It's really lovely. They're kind of anywhere between five minutes and 25 and they read the poem, they analyse it a bit and then they read the poem again. Um, and Basement Poetry podcast um, is a really DIY one that does a similar thing. And here in Australia, we've got James Laidler doing the Lit Poetry Poetry podcast, um, which I've really gotten into as well. And I just, I can imagine that teachers who want to get better at poetry teaching, um, you could come along to the Queensland Poetry Festival, of course, anytime this week and uh, online through the Emerge program. Um, but Apart from that, and our PD that we do through English teachers associations or um, things like that, where do you learn how to lead people through analysis? Um, I think podcasts like that can be so useful. Um, so just wanted to give a shout out to those. Um, all right, we've lost one. She may come back shortly. In the meantime, our perhaps final question, which is poems that you have found help to elicit responses from students in your classes. Um, so tell us what you would recommend or what's worked for you. Um, well, I'm happy to kick off with a slightly broader take on that, um, which is more to do with kind of poem poets in general, whose work I really like to teach. Um, I really love to teach Jaya Savage's poetry, which is, is so complex and so dense. Uh, with language and with with particularly a sense of of play and delight um, and there's something incredibly fun about reading his poems with students because to start with sometimes they find it difficult to sort of unpack there's so much packed in uh, to a single line or a single stanza that it takes them a while to sort of unspool the image and I, I love to read his poems with them because I think there's there's so much for us to explore together and and so it's such a kind of original mind at work in those poems that that is always it's never failed uh, in higher education in school workshops that I've done to elicit some sort of excited reaction from students and from readers um, who find oh I, I didn't really think that that was something you might put in a poem I didn't think that would be an image that could be there. I can't believe he managed, you know, particularly in Change Machine, the way that he's able to uh, do these sort of um, anagrammatical reworkings of words. Um, there's there's such a complexity, but such a sense of play at the same time. Mm. Nice one. Yeah, feel free to invoke a whole poet or, <laughs> you know, a whole period of poetry if that helps you. Um, who can help us out with another one? Okay. Oh. oh, no, oh. Sam, you go. Sorry. Go ahead. You guys. Oh, I quite often um, will pull out a, a Nirvana, Nirvana lyrics, or this by Alonis Morissette. Just, uh, yeah, try to. Try to play it up a little bit, uh, give them to, I mean, it depends on the time of day, really, like. If oh, that's insightful. And the kids are, are fresh, you know, you, you could give them something really, really dark, like, but I mean, be being careful, through like Nick Cave. Depends on their age, really. Um, the pit and the pendulum. You know, um, you know, I'm writing horror now, and uh, my my whole world is, you know. That dark, oh, well, that's the thing. There, there's a competition uh, somewhere in the world every year where people uh, try and 
the fell through by the Admiral, dark and stormy night. Mm. They go on, you know, that's such an amazing line. Yeah. And see where you go from there. Yeah. 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 I love the idea of Nirvana, one of my favourite pairings to do, and it's always, it's one of my, you know, if any of my students end up watching this, they'll know I've done this with most classes, is um, Robert Frost's Road Not Taken with Led Zeppelin's ah! Stairway, with, yeah. with Stairway to Heaven, and then you kind of go like, ah, oh, but can you actually choose the road that you're on? Led Zeppelin say you can, and there's always time. I just discovered that poem yesterday. Ah, it's it's so good. And it's yeah. some magical phenomenon where no matter what group I've got, unless it's English teachers, um, but whether it's year 10 or second year uni, um, they're always new to the twist, you know, that were they the same path or not. Anyway, so it's just a, it's a classic. Um, yeah. And I get them to illustrate it. Someone taught me to do this with a year 10 class a long time ago. And you can use it with any poem, obviously, that has a lot of evocative imagery, is you can print it out on an A4 sheet of paper, do it digitally if you want, and um, they illustrate the poem on the paper as well. So it's a really simple technique, but it's so good for two roads. Um, okay, who else hasn't shared one yet? Angela, have you got one that brings stuff out for kids? Uh, yeah, look, or any honestly, students of any age, yeah. When I'm teaching young people, often I will go and have a flick through like past APS or even slam ed um, finalists or winners that are, are from about that same age group. It's really nice for young people to see other young people doing performance poetry. I think it makes it a little bit more achievable um, for them and a little bit more realistic and they get to see kind of their peers doing those things. Um, so often I'll pull examples from there and kind of try and find, you know, really good ones to show them um, as a kind of a bit of an aspirational thing. But, yeah, the, a lot of the people that I would have recommended for spoken word are slowly getting added to the curriculum, so that's good. Um, yeah. Yeah, which is good. Like every, I think Luca is who everybody teaches in schools. It's the one performance poet that every English teacher seems to know who he is. Well, he's been on the HSC list for a little while. That doesn't yeah. hurt. So that's I think cool. Eleanor Jackson has something in curriculum now, and she's amazing. Like, um, always recommend her stuff. And yeah, Kay Tempest is awesome. It's also on curriculum. That's great. Mm. I think something that just riffing off that I find quite useful, um, even though I mentioned like Frost and Zeppelin before, um, is you know to work with poems who are in the industry right now. Um, and I'll invite any closing thoughts for this. We won't have time to go all the way around, but anyone else can add on this too, which is um, if educators don't support the poetry industry, then that limits its future. And there are so many educators that are there who could do that work. And so when I, when I have to choose a poem to bring in, more often than not, I will try and choose one from a poet who's in their career at the moment trying to sell their volumes, trying to make money, trying to sell tickets um, to get them that audience. So I, I do like to do that. And for any teachers out there who haven't thought yet about how vital we are to the lifeblood of the poetry landscape in this country, I think it's time to think about that um, because in a context where government funding as well as every other kind of funding is dwindling and dwindling for all of the arts, as well as for poetry. Um, it's the patrons, you know, it's the fans, just like with your favorite indie band, you know, you have to buy the record, otherwise they stop touring. So um, I've really appreciated this panel tonight for bringing so many of us together to encourage that intersection or crossing over. Um, does anyone else want to speak to that? We've got a few more minutes. I think that's a good thing to think about as we close. Kelly, can I just plug, um... Anya Wolwitz because I find her fantastic in the classroom. I like to confront students with her voice and I like to confront them with her style and that kind of the block approach that she uses. Um, I've done a lot of great things with her Australia poem. Kids get so confronted and often quite offended <laughs> by the voice that comes through, so it's been very powerful. And recently I've done a lot of work with her girls in terms of exposing stereotypes and gender stereotypes 
um, and then asking kids to think about one of the labels perhaps that's ascribed to them and then to to respond with with their own poems. So um, she's, I think, you know, passed away, but Australian poet, very powerful. And also if I can just plug two works that as a teacher I found really useful in terms of reading um, how analysis can be done in a slightly different way. I really enjoyed um, Fishing for Lightning, Sarah Holland Batts collection and also The Fire of Joy by Clive um, Clive James. Um, and both of those takes on how we can respond in an analytical but also personal way, I think it helps us to approach that kind of we don't have to just write an analytical essay in the English classroom. It can be for the real world. Um, so I just like to plug those two texts too. Awesome. Thank you. Glad you did that. Um, all right. Well, as we're quite close to eight, feel free to chuck another comment in the text or, um, but final sign offs before I throw back to Shane. Otherwise we'll say thank you so much um, to our poets and educators for coming along tonight. Shane, wasn't it good? I'll turn your mute off, Shane. <laughs> oh, oh, damn. I nah. said <laughs> it was very, very interesting. And I really, I loved the, the tips. I, you know, I've worked in education uh, before and uh, I, you know, found something really enjoyable about that. Turning people on to poetry is a lifelong sort of endeavour and being able to do it uh, in the classroom, I think, is a, is a real a real privilege and it was wonderful to hear uh, all of your um, wonderful takes uh, on uh, how that might be done and improved and all for the good of poetry. So... I think that's fantastic. So thank you very much. Um, I just want to uh, thank, uh, as well as thanking all of our panellists and, and Kelly for running this, uh, I want to thank you for joining us. And I, uh, I guess Kelly mentioned it a couple of times, the Queensland Poetry Festival live version, Emerge Live, will be happening. Uh, our opening night is on uh, 3rd of January at the Judith Wright Centre in Fortitude Valley. Uh, and Sam Wagon Watson will be there uh, reading some poetry on opening night as well as some other fantastic poets. So if you haven't checked out the program already, uh, please do. And I, I hope to, to see you there. Come and say good day. It'd be lovely to see you. Thank you, everybody. And um, we'll see you uh, very soon. Take care.